Good morning. good morning. That's a good way to get us started here. We are glad to see them in place. Welcome to worship on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. And this is the other end of July 4th since it came in the middle of the week and some are traveling. We're glad that you have traveled this way. And if you're visiting with us, we are delighted that you are here. If you are worshiping online, and if uh, you would like a copy of the worship materials, you may go to the website. A banner will uh, come up to tell you what to do, and uh, you can have the same material as the rest of us. And uh, I'm just going to do a shout-out here. It's good to see uh, Katie and Nick back because they have brought someone else with them. They brought Archer with them today, and uh, so... <laughs> Archer was joined, uh, well, was born June 5th, 
Yeah, I, all right, I've got June 5th, and so uh, he's having his first outing, and so we're glad to get some of us back together. Join me in the call to worship. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Our opening hymn is number eight, Eternal Father Strong to Save. Proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Almighty God, you led people to this land, and out of conflict created in us a love, peace, and liberty. We have failed our heritage neglecting rights and restricting freedoms. Forgive the pride that prevents us from seeing our own shortcomings. Forgive the division caused by prejudice and greed. Have mercy on the heart of this great land. Help us to be compassionate, fair, and helpful to each other. Raise up in us the right patriotism that sees and seeks this nation's good. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be in, at peace. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thank you, God.
mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Please share the peace with those around you. Welcome once again to this service. If you have not already done so, will you uh, find and attach and sign the registration of attendance slip and let us know that you were here in person. If you are worshiping with us live online, if you will use the comment line, then we will have a record that you were with us. We are always excited about seeing uh, who all was with us live. And of course, there are many, many others that uh, are with us afterwards, and if so, you're still, you're part of the deal here. Oh, uh, today, there's a couple of things going to happen after church. One is there will be a brief call meeting of the session for the purpose of receiving new members, and that meeting will be in the conference room. And then for the rest of you, and we're going to join it, there is a uh, Fourth of July lunch in, out in the gathering area, and so we invite you to stay and to be uh, a part of that. Going down the list here that uh, the Finance Committee meeting is going to be delayed one week, but on Tuesday morning, the card crew is going to meet, and they, instead of designing cards, are going to uh, finish designing uh, markers for the hymn book. So we're going to have custom made markers to keep your place in the hymn book uh, thanks to the card crew. Uh, now I am trying to read something and I, oh yeah, I, I just said what I'm trying to, if you saw my writing you would not be surprised. At what. <laughs> we have begun uh, a, an emphasis in, in lieu of our school drive. You've seen it in the news, e-news. Oh, you've read the e-news, haven't you? <laughs> so you have seen it, and you've seen it in the newsletter, and you remember that we talked about it last week, but we are, are buying a kind of uh, calculator for the schools in lieu of our usual school supply drive for Presbyterian Children's Home and Services, and so we invite you to remember that. And while we are, are doing that, we would uh, also tell you that we had for uh, this month, we had about a three-week emphasis on uh, 
special offering for helping hands in honor of Cheryl Ta Taylor's retirement, you all have produced a little over $2,000 in that. So um, there are a lot of hungry people that will be grateful for uh, what uh, you have done. So well done, good and faithful servants. Our readings today, we have, we are doing a, a balance and understanding that our, uh, that our emphasis upon the celebration of our faith heritage and our nation and our music relates to that, some readings relate to that, the scriptures relate to that, and hopefully the homily. A homily is supposed to be a short sermon, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And so don't look at your watch and don't, to, be, uh, to say that I didn't make it. But in any case, we are going to proceed to that as Dennis leads us in our scripture and other readings. This morning we have two Old Testament scripture readings. The first is Zechariah chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, and you can find that on page 881 of your Bible. Then the angel who spoke with me answered me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. He said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Our second reading this morning, is Old Testament reading, is taken from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. And if you'd like to follow along, you can find that on page 638 of your Bible. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied exultation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at a harvest, as the people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood, you shall burn as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Great will be his authority, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So ends the reading of the Old Testament. The Spirit of Liberty, a speech given by Judge Learned Hand in 1944 in celebration of I Am an American Day. We have gathered here to affirm a faith, a faith in a common purpose, a common conviction, a common devotion. Some of us have chosen America as the land of our adoption. The rest have come from those who did the same. For this reason, we have some right to consider ourselves a picked group, a group of those who had the courage to break from the past and brave the dangers and the loneliness of a strange land. What was the object that nerved us, or those who went before us to this choice? We sought liberty, freedoms from oppression, 
Freedom from want. Freedom to be ourselves. This then we sought. This we now believe that we are by way of winning. What do we mean when we say that the first of all we seek liberty? I often wonder whether we do not rest our hopes too much upon constitutions, upon laws, and upon courts. These are false hopes. Believe me, these are false hopes. Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. While it lies, while it lies there, it needs no constitution, no law, no court to save it. And what is this liberty which must lie in the hearts of men and women? It is not the ruthless, the unbridled will. It is not freedom to do as one likes. That is denial of liberty and leads us straight to this overthrow. A society in which men recognize no check upon their freedom soon becomes a society where freedom is the possession of only a savage few, as we have learned to our sorrow. What then is the spirit of liberty? I cannot define it. I can only tell you my own faith. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it is right. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which seeks to understand the mind of other men and women. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which weighs their interests alongside its own without bias. The spirit of liberty remembers that not even a sparrow falls to earth unheeded. The spirit of liberty is the spirit of him who, near 2,000 years ago, taught mankind that lesson it has never learned, but never quite forgotten that there may be a kingdom where the least shall be heard and considered side by side with the greatest. And now in that spirit, that spirit of an America which has never been and which may never be, nay, which never be exempt as the conscious and courage of Americans created, yet in the spirit of that America which lies hidden in some form, in the aspirations of us all, in the spirit of that America for which our young men are at this moment fighting and dying, in that spirit of liberty and of America, I ask you to pledge our faith in the glorious destiny of our beloved country. And we have sim him 339 <laughs>
On January 20th, 1961, President John F. Kennedy delivered his inaugural address in which he announced that, quote, we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. I'm going to read some ex excerpts from it. Um, most of you know I'm a history teacher, and I wanted to assure you all that each student I've had has studied this speech when they have finished my class. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you an almighty God the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. The world is very different now. For man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And yet the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill, that we will pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. In your hands, my fellow citizens, more than mine, will rest the final success or failure of our course. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. The graves of young Americans who answered the call to service surround the globe. Now the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to bear arms, though arms we need, not as a call to battle, though embattled we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle year in and year out. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, a struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion to which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it, and the glow from the fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man.
Our gospel reading is found in the Gospel of Mark, the fifth chapter. And we read these words which flow together with and out of what we've just heard. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I but touch his cloak, I will be made well. Immediately her flow of blood stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my cloak? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. The word of the Lord. The question and the challenge is what to do at this point in the service. In a homily at that, most churches will do some of what we're doing here in in today's worship service, including the celebration of the heritage of our nation and prayers for the nation, Many of the public celebrations, though through the close of last Thursday evening, have referenced a Christian heritage and or invoked the name or the presence of God. The obvious obvious choices today range from indulging indulging in a model and orgy of civil religion, and some will choose that option, or ignoring the secular emphasis of this weekend as if it were just another Sunday. Some will choose that option. Or try to take an opportunity to weave the two emphases together in a homily. It is said that fools rush in where angels fear to tread, So I'm ready to plunge resolutely forward. Just how do church and state really relate according to the ideals of our nation? We tend to hear a mixture of truths and half-truths and myths. July 4th celebrations are about the founding of the nation and the struggle for independence. The motivation and the financial support for early exploration and immigration to this continent were primarily related to business emphasis. It seemed a profitable thing to undertake. Many of their own early settlers brought their own expressions of the Christian faith with them. Others, such as the Puritans, were looking uh, for a place where dissent from established churches could be pursued without persecution. In a place remote from the dominance of the traditions of the old country, there grew up a, a, a laboratory for the formation of a new style of government, later characterized as government of the people, by the people, and for the people that placed more emphasis on the rights and the dignity of the individual. The rights of life, 
liberty and the pursuit of happiness included a choice of one's religion and how or whether it is to be exercised. <clears throat> a few years ago, somebody referred me to a piece on the internet reporting on part of the Maston Christian Ethics Lectures at Hardin-Simmons University's Logsdon School of Theology. Now, the speaker for this series was Brent Walker, a Southern Baptist, citing, and his was the subject of, the top 10 lies that we hear about church and state. Of course, this is a homily. So I'll just try to lift up and paraphrase a few of the 10. <clears throat> and here's the first one. Our nation's founders were born-again, Bible-believing, evangelical Christians, or our foundation, founders were enlightened rationalists who worshipped the goddess of reason, or our founders were deists who posited a watchmaker god and were suspicious of religious enthusiasms. It's difficult uh, and dangerous to generalize about the religious beliefs of the founders of this nation. All of the above, above would be true if we take them as a whole. They were all over the spectrum. Some might have been guests in a megachurch pulpit or invited to give the commencement address at Liberty University. But a goodly number of them would have been shunned. So, as Brent Walker put it, we can say with confidence that they were committed to ensuring religious liberty rather than enshrining their own religious opinions. That may or may not have been the spirit in which some groups arrived, but it was where they had come by the time they got things down on paper in this new world. Here's another one. The United States is a Christian nation. Walker says, this is a whopper. The United States is not a Christian nation either in law or in fact. No one can deny that by nature, Americans are religious people. But the Constitution is a secular document. We do not, he says, have a Christian theocracy. We have a constitutional democracy in which all religious beliefs are protected. In the old world, the monarch or the leader was often described as the defender of the faith. In our nation, leaders may well be informed and guided by their faith, but neither the current administration or the one that preceded it or the one before that and so on either defines faith, thank God, nor promotes it. The great ends of the church, which is found in our Presbyterian USA Book of Order, reminds us that in our understanding, this is the commission that's given to the church. Here's a third one. Church-state separation only keeps the government from setting up a single national church or showing preference among denominations or faith groups, but not from aiding all religions on a non-preferential basis. Although we're told that the, an early draft of the First Amendment singled out banning of a national church, Congress repeatedly declined to narrow the scope. So the First Amendment reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people to peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. 
And here's the last one I'll deal with out of the ten. And that is the Ten Commandments form the basis of our legal system. Actually, only three commandments, the ones against killing and stealing and bearing false witness, are subjects of our secular law. The other seven are religious. American law is based upon the common law of England, but the three prohibitions uh, were already a part of Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence before England was Christianized. Numerous documents that influenced the U.S. legal system say little about religion and nothing about the Ten Commandments. Well, that gives us a notion. And yet, most of our nation founders were Christians according to their concept of being a Christian, just as Christians today have differing ideas about the application of faith to life. That's why most church assemblies squabble a little whenever they get together. So I go back to the original question of where the balance of civil religion and the Christian religion. Where do they separate? And where do they come together? Well, in thinking about all of this and in reviewing it, I thought about the little incident that we read from Mark's gospel today. Jesus had become known as one who could heal. In fact, he was going to the home of Jairus, a synagogue leader whose little girl was dying. On the way to that house, there was a woman in the crowd who was at the point of desperation. Mark tells us that for 12 years she had suffered hemorrhages, she had been to every doctor that was available, and she had spent all that she had. And Mark adds this interesting editorial comment. She had endured much under many physicians, and often that has been true. Nothing had done any good. In fact, she kept getting worse. And then she said to herself, as Jesus came into the area, if I could just touch his clothes. And in the aftermath, when she did touch his garments and she was healed, Jesus told her, daughter, your faith has made you well. In Jesus Christ, we have seen most clearly the Creator who values individual dignity. He is the one that uh, Isaiah has described as wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And we believe it is under the influence of the revelation that one professing Christian or not, can come to the conclusion that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You see, I believe that the great strides forward in this nation's history have been made when we have touched the hem of Christ's garments. And our faith has made us well. I believe that when we turn back to these ineffective physicians of human ignorance and greed and self-interest, then we embarrass ourselves as a nation and when done under the banner of religion, we have besmirched and belittled the name of Christian. So here we are surrounding July 4th, 2024. We swell with justifiable celebration at those times when in our formation of a nation, we have reached out in faith and have been made well from some inherited human ills. 
We admit with justifiable contrition when we have ignored the ideals of our faith or have used it for self-serving purposes. We pray with justifiable faith that we remain true or return to our highest ideals as a people for those we elect or allow to lead us and for better days ahead. The Christian faith works only when it is freely chosen. We cannot wish to have it coerced or imagine it should be gained by osmosis in an imagined Christian society. We live in a nation that gives opportunity to freely choose, freely follow, freely share. His truth is still marching on. So today I wonder what greater things lie ahead if we just recover or just find or just have the faith to reach out and touch this Christ that he might make us well. Thanks be to God. You know, something in my throat today, and I'm going to have a hard time with it, but there was a song that I actually heard from a Pentecostal person. You might as well learn it. I'm going to squeak it out, and then if you'll squeak it back after me with each phrase, and we'll see if we can learn it together. And it goes like this. Oh, it is Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus. Again. Oh, it is Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus in my soul. Oh, it is Jesus in my soul. For I have touched the hem of his garment. For I have touched the hem of his garment. And his love has made me whole. And his love has made me whole. Now all of it. Oh, it is Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus in my soul. For I have touched the hem of his garment, and his love has made me. Well, that's an affirmation of faith, but let's stand and let's say this one. That is an affirmation that we've been using for at least a thousand years, and these are the words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our time of giving comes now, and so let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Jesus said, give to the emperor the things that belong to the emperor, and to God the things that are God. Thank you.
Please be seated. Lift up your hearts. For our nation, the church, and the world, and all in need, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, in your mercy, Almighty and eternal God, we give you thanks for those who have gone before us to enact within a nation a laboratory for the freedom and the dignity of all. And we give thanks for this vast land, rich in physical and human resources. Keep your plans and our ideals before us, that as a nation we may be worthy of the blessings that you have heaped upon us, Help each of us to stand ready to be used in your purposes so that America may become, in truth, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Lord, in your mercy, God of ages, in your sight nations rise and fall and pass through times of peril. In this time when our land is troubled, be near to judge and to save. May leaders be led by your wisdom. May they seek after your will and see it clearly. If we have turned from your way, help us to repent and reverse our ways. Give us your light and your truth to guide us. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, keep this nation under your care. Grant that we may be a people of peace among ourselves and a blessing to other nations of the earth. Help us to elect trustworthy leaders, contribute to wise decisions for the general welfare, and thus serve you faithfully in our generation. Bless and guide the courts and magistrates of our land. Give them the spirit of wisdom and understanding that they may perceive the truth and administer the law impartially as instruments of your divine will. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, you made us in your own image, and you redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred that infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in the bonds of love, and through our struggle and confusion, work to accomplish your purposes on earth. Be with those whose lives are troubled and shackled by infirmity and pain, by mistrust and cynicism, by injustice and oppression, and guide those who, by your Spirit, heal our physical and emotional diseases those who teach and counsel, those who protect our lives and our freedoms. Lord, in your mercy, Lord God, you look deep within our innermost resources of our hearts. In our silence, look within and hear the cries of our deepest need. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord God, you are always more ready to bestow your good gifts upon us than we are to seek them. You are more willing to give than we desire or deserve. Help us to seek that we may truly find, to ask that we may joyfully receive, so to knock that the door of mercy may be opened for us through Jesus Christ our Lord and with the confidence of the children of God we pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
our concluding hymn is 337, My Country Tis of Thee. family, nation, whatever, but let's reach out and touch it because he's always there. So the Lord be with you. May the Lord give you peace at all times and in all places and in every way. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.